Hi guys. So we've been shopping again and we picked up a lot more x-ray gear. So this is a Siemens head and in here is a rotating anode tube and it's also got a built-in power supply. Now I know this for a fact because I've seen another YouTuber, Kaiser Power Electronics, take one of these apart before. If you don't know about Kaiser Power Electronics, fantastic channel. Guys, check it out. Guy really knows what he's doing. Fantastic videos on that channel. So please guys check that out. So we're going to take this apart. And uh, we might go a little bit step further than Kaiser did. We'll try and get this tube running. I don't mean putting out x-rays. I mean we'll try and get it rotating. And we'll have a little play around with the power supply in this. So we'll crack this open guys. And then I'll be back to you. So as we start to disassemble this. First thing we notice there's a uh, lead ring here. With threads on. So we can remove this. Out this comes. And then we have some aluminium cups in here. And these are obviously. Um, the purpose for these is to cut down the soft x-rays so obviously to reduce the dose to the patient they put aluminium filters in here and that cuts out all the soft stuff and only lets through the high energy stuff obviously reducing the dose to the patient then we've got some uh, beam shaping stuff this is obviously another lead insert and this is obviously just to uh, shape the beam as it comes through the aperture and then after that we've just got the aperture itself and inside there is the x-ray tube Obviously this is oil filled, so we'll get these allen bolts out and then we'll uh, take a look inside. So we've just unbolted this flange. This flange is where the uh, collimation section actually attaches and the collimator just has X and Y plates made of lead to obviously narrow the beam so only the portion of the patient that needs to be x-rayed gets the beam. Obviously uh, if you only want to x-ray a small amount then you'll just close up the collimator and therefore narrow the beam and limit the exposure again. So that's what that plate does. Right guys, so I've removed the half million bolts that were in this, so I think we can lift off the lid now. So we'll just before we open this lid, I'll just draw your attention to this side. This is the input side. So there's two inputs here for the high frequency that drives the onboard high voltage transformer. And then there's a couple of other inputs for the uh, filament transformer. Now these across here are gas tubes like a gas discharge tube and they are just transient voltage suppressors they do the same job as an MOV or Zener diode apart from being a gas filled tube they're really reliable and the idea of that is inside this tank there's a very high value resistor and then we use a low value resistor to, to form a voltage divider so should this external resistor go open circuit we could end up with a very high voltage so that would just clamp this and same goes for the current so obviously we use an external shunt and if that went open circuit then we'd have the same problem a high voltage. So these are just transient voltage suppressors. So there's not much else to see here. There's actually a bimetallic switch here. This obviously uh, if the tank gets too hot this will open and uh, stop it running. And there's also a pressure switch. Now that's there for if we develop any arcing problems inside here. With it being a high voltage transformer there's a chance of arcing or arcing across the tube even. So that's there. Obviously if there's any arcing They'll cut, that'll create pressure in the tank and that'll deactivate the tank. Right, not much else to see on top, so we'll get this cracked open and we'll have a close look inside. Right guys, so now we've removed the uh, tube assembly and the uh, filament transformer. So what we're left with now is the, uh, the front cover, the aperture and glass and uh, this rubber bladder. And this rubber bladder is just simply to let the oil expand and contract with temperature. So we'll move on Right now. guys, so we've got this thing apart a bit further. So over on the other side we've got two transformers, they're high frequency, probably about 6 to 8 kilohertz iron core transformers. And those feed into these voltage doublers. Now these are two capacitors and each capacitor contains two capacitors. So basically we've got a string of diodes, a string of diodes, a cap and a cap. So that's one voltage doubler and then the same again for the other side. This is a bipolar supply so we have a plus and minus supply limiting to the voltage to ground. So basically one voltage doubler, two voltage doublers. These are high value resistors to sense the voltage and like I said we use an external resistor to make a divider between this and the external resistor. Now these are the output resistors and these are to protect the diodes and on the back of here are some uh, compensation capacitors and that's just to knock off the high frequency so we get a nice smooth DC to monitor our voltage. So nothing very interesting here, like I said, 
two capacitors in each capacitor and two strings of diodes one string two string another string and another string so it's a full wave rectifier made up of two doublers and then we've got the uh, two high frequency uh, transformers right guys so this is the tube we removed from that housing so this is a rotating anode tube and i'll explain that more in a minute and this is the stator so for you guys who understand how an induction motor works you have a stator which is obviously stationary and you have the rotor which obviously rotates now the rotor on here is actually inside the tube and rotates the anode and this is the stator but before this we'll look at a normal x-ray tube and we'll have a quick look at the x-ray physics and then we'll have another closer look at this so we'll start off by looking at this much lower powered tube so as you can see in here we have an anode this one's a stationary anode doesn't rotate because it's designed for much lower power and we have a cathode at the bottom so what the cathode is is a piece of tungsten wire and this wire is heated so it glows red hot and at that point it starts to emit electrons you get an electron cloud around this and obviously, if nothing else happens, these electrons are just hovering around here and jumping in and out of this piece of wire. But if we introduce a very high potential positive at this end, because the electrons are negative, they'll accelerate towards the anode. So obviously, this is in an evacuated tube, as you can see. So there's nothing to stop these electrons from accelerating at very high speed towards the anode. Now the anode is made up of a copper jacket and in there there's a very hard metal called tungsten and it's a really dense metal as well. Now there's two ways to form x-rays. When an electron is accelerating, if it's slowed down or even stopped, it has to give up some energy and the way it gives up that energy is in the form of a photon, so we get an x-ray. And the other way we get an x-ray is if we get a high energy electron comes in and knocks out an electron from the shell of the tungsten atom. So if we knock out an electron from one of the shells, an electron from a higher shell will drop down to take its place. But in dropping down, it has to give up some energy. And again, it will give up that energy in the form of a photon, which is an X-ray. Now the effect of producing X-rays is very, very inefficient. Only 1% of the energy that's actually put in is actually comes out in the form of X-rays. So if we put 50 kilowatts into a system, we only get out 500 watts x-ray power so as you can imagine there's quite a lot of loss and that loss is given up as heat so in the smaller tubes we get around that by using a large anode and a small duty cycle but that moves on to the next thing which is a rotating anode so this tube we're looking at now the one we removed from this unit is a very high powered x-ray tube and this thing can put out 40 to 50 kilowatts i think in fact let me just look at the numbers on this this is a 135.30. So you're talking 135 kilovolts and uh, 30 kilowatts. So 30 kilowatts is a lot of energy. And as you might imagine, 30 kilowatts on something like this and melt it in no time. So what they do is actually spin up this anode so the electron beam is hitting a different place all the time. And even at that, you can see, if you look closely, there's quite a lot of damage to this anode. I do actually have a brand new tube so we can compare the difference. Now this is a new unused tube and if you look at the anode in there I think you can agree there's quite a stark difference. Right so now we'll put on the stator and we'll run this up and you can have a look at this rotating. Right, so we've got the stator in place, we've had to add a capacitor, because obviously we have to create a phase shift. So if you understand how an induction motor works, you understand that we have to create a phase shift to get this to rotate. So we've done that, we've got this set up, wired up to one variac, and then we've got the heater wired up to my power supply here. Obviously we're not going to apply any high voltage, I mean, we don't want to generate any x-rays. I mean, that's not safe at all, and it's probably illegal, so uh, there's no chance of us ever doing anything like that. But we can demonstrate how this thing runs. We'll get it rotating, and then we'll apply some heat current, and you'll be able to see it lit up. Right, guys, so we've got the anode rotating now. 
Then the next thing we'd need is some heater current. A lot of tubes have two heaters in there. They have a small focal spot and a large focal spot. This tube just has one. So we'll apply some heater current. And as you can see, it starts to glow. So that will create the thermionic emission. And now all we'd have to do if we wanted x-rays from this thing is apply a large potential difference between the anode and cathode and this thing would generate x-rays. These are really interesting and the bearings in there are fantastic. And I'll just demonstrate how fantastic they are. We'll disconnect the power supplies and we'll disconnect the uh, stator and we'll actually remove the stator. And this thing, if left alone, would take probably 10, 20, maybe even 30 minutes to stop, stop rotating. Absolutely amazing bearings in these things. The darkening on the glass, I'm pretty sure is caused by the x-rays. And it might even be some deposits from the tungsten wire in there, getting hot. Interestingly, with this tube, if you can see, they've actually ground down this glass. And that's so they can get x-rays from this thing at lower energies. Obviously the glass stops quite a lot of x-rays so if they want to use this for something like soft tissue for example mammography or uh, looking at tissue muscles or anything like that then obviously they'd only want a very low potential across this thing so they've ground the glass very thin so they can get x-rays out of this at a much lower potential. An interesting failure point for a tube like this after a long life the tungsten filament in here will actually leave deposits on the glass and after so long, it does actually become conductive. So at very high potential, you'll start to get arcing inside the tube, right across from the cathode to the anode. And that's when a tube's nearing the end of its life. Right, so we'll slow this down now. We'll take a uh, neodymium magnet and we'll uh, put that across here. And you can obviously hear that now decelerating. But these things just spin forever. The bearings in there are just incredible. I think the only thing left now is to have a look at the transformers that drove this thing. I've disconnected the voltage doublers, not really interested in wiring those back up, but we can have a quick look at the transformers. So I'll wire those up guys and then we'll have a quick look at those. So guys, last thing to do is look at these small transformers like we said. So we've got a ground on here. So we've got the transformers tied together in series and then this midpoint's grounded and obviously then we've got the primaries connected together they're in parallel but anti-phase so obviously they'll work together so we'll get an output from each side high voltage like i say i'm not going to rewire up the uh, voltage doubler obviously whatever we'll get from this obviously we'll get double that with the voltage double on there but we'll just have a quick play with these and see what we can get from them and we are uh, powering it from my half bridge running at about six kilohertz Right guys, we've opened this up to 17 centimetres now, so we're really pushing it. So let's see if we can get this to strike. I think we can all agree that's a pretty big jump from them two small transformers. I don't know whether it's opened up anymore, or I think we should uh, leave them as they are. I mean, I don't know if I want to destroy these transformers. We'll open it up another centimetre, if it can do that, then I think we'll just call it a day. But 18 centimetres on there now, this is really pushing these transformers hard. Let's see if we can get it to strike. Fantastic. Alright guys, thanks for watching, more to come soon, thanks guys.